Hi, thank you. Now, um, I sincerely believe that it is through a family that God has planned for us, mankind, to thrive. Right? So family is His design modality for us to thrive in this world. Why? Because in Genesis 128, this is God's first blessing. Oh, I say, see lah, first time, forgot to click. Ah, this is God's first blessing to Adam and Eve when they were formed. God said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, birds in the sky, and every other living creature that moves on the ground. Now, human babies are not like durians on a tree. You know, once the durian is ripe, drop, that's it. The tree forgets about it and move on. Human babies cannot. Once they come out of the mother, you still need to take care, change diapers. Children require protection, nurturing, education, and all this needs to be done in a familial context. Right? Therefore, I'm very certain that when God's first blessing that was declared over mankind to prosper and take control of the environment, it is through a family. It is through a communion of a man and a woman that are married. And therefore, the bedrock of a strong family is established through a healthy and proper marriage between a man and a woman. And God, in the Bible, uh, Gospel Matthew, is said that, have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And say, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. And they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Now, last week, Pastor Colin shared with us on this message on the significance of a marriage. And, and one of that is actually for the furtherance of mankind, right? Through procreation and giving birth. Now, the bedrock and foundation of a strong family, as I repeat, is through a healthy marriage. And I was listening to the message online because... I just arrived in Singapore that day and I wanted, though I wanted to come to church, but I thought better stay at home and keep myself uh, under to monitor properly because, you know, in Europe, uh, people don't wear masks like we do in Singapore. So, so I, I, I listened to the message online. It's actually very impactful. So I do urge all of us who have missed it in some way or just want to recall what was, what, what was said last week to listen to it when it's up online. Now, the joining of a man and a woman through the covenant of a marriage is a sacred bond between two persons. Now, sometimes even in the Bible, it's said that basically you use that relationship to describe Jesus' relationship with his church. Now, we all know... <coughs> ah, okay. Now, we all know how this story developed, right? So, before... So, God created Adam. God created Eve. That's the first couple in the Bible. Now, before... Any children was birthed from Adam and Eve. Mr. S. A. Tan came into the picture. Huh? Now, would that be different if Eve was tempted after childbirth? Now, we didn't know. right? But essentially, the enemy came and threw doubt into Eve's understanding of God's very simple instruction. Do not eat from this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, of course, a lot of us will now know that Eve is guilty of having to succumb to the lies of the enemy. But... I think Adam also paid, or Adam also need to pay uh, his due. As a man, as a head of the family, he did not exercise his authority as a husband to put a stop to this whole thing. Now, that's why I think the enemy targeted Eve in the first place, right? Because uh, if you ask any man now, or especially me, uh, well, I'll be clueless anyway, right? The other day I was at NTUC, right? Then I saw this guy, he was on his video, he was on WhatsApp, he was on video calling his wife. He was standing in front of the milk, uh, the baby milk uh, category, and he was filming every single one, you know. Naika, Naika, near or my Naika, which one do you want me to buy? Right? Clearly, the wife gave instruction, he forgot. Now he wanna make sure he buy the right milk powder because milk powder is very expensive, right? You buy the wrong can, go back, show sure, kana hantaman. So I tell you, if the guy was Adam, and if the enemy were to ask him, hey, you eat from that tree, he sure say, wait, I go back and ask my wife first. <laughs> Guess what the wife will say? Don't be stupid, lah. And that will put an end already. Now we will probably still be in Eden. Okay? So, so that, was, that was basically what happened um, at the start. Now, where, where am I leading to? Because subsequently, after they have sinned, they have fallen out of Eden, right? Both Adam and Eve got evicted. Okay? Their work became a chore, childbirth became painful, and out came Cain. This is a picture that I drew from the net. Uh, the elder son called Cain, the younger one, Kana Hantaman, is called Abel. Now, Cain was jealous of Abel because God favoured Abel's offering over him. 
right? And out of jealousy, Cain basically murdered Abel. Now, this was the first record of a dysfunctional family in the Bible. And frankly, if you look through the Bible, there are many instances of dysfunctional family. King David himself is one colourful example. I'm just surprised that up to now, Hollywood never really quite took up this story because this story can film like 400, 500 episodes, no problem. A lot of, a lot of things that, frankly, quite, quite are a one uh. But King David, and he was still called a man of God's heart, right? So he, he, he has basically done a lot of wrong things. So the question remains, is family still part of God's plans for us to thrive, right? And I think the answer is yes. God's word never returned to him void. Amen? Now, that is what's said in Isaiah 55, 11. So after 1,000 over years, out came this guy called Noah. Now, the only chap that God found worthy in this world, right, when the whole world was unacceptable and has fallen into evil. Now, God's plan was continued to preserve mankind through Noah's family line, right? Now, all of us may be very familiar, so just let me skip to the part, right? So God basically picked Noah, his wife, three sons, three daughter-in-laws, right? Asked Noah to build himself this big ark, put them inside, and a pair of each kind of animals that I think God feels that he wants to save. Now, through this plan, God redeemed mankind through a family, right? Noah, three kids, daughter-in-law. Again, showing that family is a key component of his plans to redeem mankind. Now, just a little trivia here. This is a word in Chinese called chuan called boat, right? If you were to deconstruct this word, ah, you see, pa ko jo. What does pa ko mean? Pa is eight, mouth, mouth also means person in Chinese, and uh, jo is a vessel. So, so interestingly, the Chinese word boat is equivalent to the vessel that carried eight person. Similar to the ark, of course the ark got other animals, la. if you write other animals inside, nobody will learn Chinese already, right? <laughs> so, but most importantly, it's not the animals, it's the eight person in the boat. Okay, so Noah, wife, Shem, wife, Ham, wife, Japheth, wife, so eight human beings in that boat. Why? Now, is it a coincidence? I think so. And I think really there's a lot of connection between the Chinese culture and that of Bible. And Pastor Colin actually has researched this quite deeply, so I hope someday he will come here and bless us with all those things that he has researched upon, the similarities between Chinese culture and the Bible itself. All right, so that was a little side line. Um, so back to Noah. After the flood, Noah, his three sons and the daughter-in-laws and his wife were now the new source for the propagation of mankind. Now, not only that, he continued through this family line. And if you were to see this diagram, a little bit small, but essentially from Noah, he continues that bloodline which lead all the way down to Jesus. Okay? Now, if you recall, in the Gospel, when John the Baptist was scolding the Pharisees, he did say that, uh, seduces that you guys are vipers, right? He says, you think God wants to preserve you just because you're Adam, uh, Abraham's offspring. God could have created men from rocks. So essentially, God doesn't need to go through Noah. But his faithfulness over his blessing remains that he will continue to bless the family through, through bless humankind through family, right? So regardless of what happens now in your life, know that God is true to his words and promises as what Tiha has shared. Now, his nature is one of love, and he loves you enough not to leave you alone. Amen? Now, believing in Jesus is not the end game, but it's, also the, it's just the start of a sanctification process for God to transform us to be more and more Christ-like. And believing in God is not just about, you know, after we have done, lead a life here, then we go up and join Him. But it's to, God's plan is to, for us to reign in this life. Right? As what Apostle Paul said in Romans 5, 17, that through Adam, sin entered the world and brought death through his trespasses. Jesus' sacrifice will inversely usher in not just life, but ability for all of us who believe to lead a triumphant life as what God intended us to do. Now, many of us may currently feel that we are not exactly reigning right now. Right, especially with all the economic situation after COVID. But it is what the scripture says. And we have to lay our faith on this scripture by faith and by submission to God. Amen? So, even if you look here, in Romans 8, Apostle Paul says, He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, 
How will He not along with Him graciously give us all things? Not something, not most things, but all things. But what does this all things point towards? In 1 Timothy 6.17, it is said very clearly that God gives us all things to do good. In Ephesians 2.10, it is also clearly stated that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, that God prepared us beforehand to walk in them. So that is God's intention for us, is to reign in life. And even in the only thing that the disciples asked Jesus was to ask Him how to pray. And even then, Jesus said, to pray for God's will to be done on earth as in heaven. So clearly, God wants us to triumph and to conquer and to live like overcomers in our life here. Now, in our earlier positions, we know that His intention was for us to lead an overcoming life and a life that is equipped to do good. Now, His resources and will are ready to back us up if we are willing to lead a surrendered life, one that allows God's perfect will to be done in and through us. Therefore, brothers and sisters, if the situation is not yet good in our lives, God is not true with us yet. Amen? Okay. So, really, uh, as I said before, God is sovereign. His word carry the causative effect and they never fail Him. So when, one, when God wanted to create the world, He spoke it into being. Likewise, His initial blessings over Adam and Eve, over Noah and the family, continues to be in effect. His will is for us to lead a fruitful life and to multiply through the formation of a healthy and strong family. And this is exactly why the concept of the family is under attack. Now, a few weeks ago, I was listening to a sermon by Pastor Bill Johnson uh, from Battle Church in the USA. Now, you know how, actually, how the context of what they are facing right now is actually a lot worse than what we are facing in Singapore. But, he mentioned a point that resonated so much with me. He said, you will know what the enemy is most worried about by what they are attacking the most ferociously. And you don't need to look very far. You just turn on your handphone today, go to the keyboard called emoji, and click it and go and search the icons that represent family. Now, these people are very lazy. They don't want to type family. Just go and click on the emoji. And the picture speaks a thousand words, right? So this is a collection of icons that I have basically screen grabbed. Five icons that basically represent our definition or what conventional family looks like, right? Mother, father, one kid, two kid. So for uh, Jerry, Paisei, uh, your, yours, maybe you need to add a lot more later because screen very small. Huh? Now, this is, this, is, this is what we think family is, but this is not what the world thinks the family is. They added another 10 more icons. Mother, mother, father, father. Okay? So essentially, brothers and sisters, this is what the world thinks a family is. Under the guise of inclusiveness, they have added in all this. And the best part is you can't erase them from your phone, you know? That's your phone. But they decide what goes into your phone. All right? So the fight is now in right here at our doorstep. This is how offensive things can get right now. Right? So let's sober up, brothers and sisters. The fight is no longer somewhere in the West. It's no longer somebody else's fight. The fight is here and the fight is now. Right? The, th the concept of family is actually under threat. This is actually what I believe a family should be. It is a basic social unit formed by parents, which means a man and a woman married to one another and have children, which is either by birth or by adoption. This is straight and narrow. This is something when I grew up, I thought it was universal. Now it no longer holds true. I was also reminded by some others when I was preparing this sermon, hey, don't be too overt about these things huh? because uh, people may think that you are bigger and the young generation will just tune off. right? But I think we need to take a step. Singapore to date is still abiding by Section 377A uh, and it's still legit. right? But just as we are about to come to today, I think two days ago, Ipsos just did a survey to say that less than half of Singaporeans now actually accept that uh, a family definition can consist of a man, man, woman, woman. Right? So this just happened a few days back, if you read Straits Times. This is, this is, this is, uh, this is not conspiracy theory, this is mainstream media upfront in your face telling you that the concept of family now, more than half of Singapore population, but I don't know how they do their survey, but according to them, more than half of Singapore population 
But the good news is that we still got about 46% or so that still contains, that still stick to this definition, right? And there is an event held in Hong Lim Park not too far away, right? Paint it in pink, celebrate love, they say, celebrate inclusiveness and being forbearing. Love, inclusiveness, forbearing, all good. But behind that, there is an agenda. So let me remind everyone, the fight is here. The Bible tells us to fight a good fight. Right? So defend these right values in your own home. Do not let the fallen world decide and detect that for your family. Amen? Because God says in Genesis 1.27 right, that He created male and female and these both are in His image. Now, all of us have a... We are designed by God. There is a design, right? Even though all of us look very different, Ken is more handsome than me. He, he looks fantastic, you know, the hair, all the salt and pepper look and all that. But the features are the same, right? Two eyes, one nose, one mouth. Our internal organs are also the same, one liver, two kidneys. There is a design. And when there's a design, there's a designer. So if the designer, if the design product don't perform according to what is being designed for, it's suboptimal. All right? And if there's a designer, where do you think the instruction manual is? It's called the Bible, right? Nowadays, people are telling us that we are random, random products from millions of years of evolution, right? Which means at some point in time, we were monkeys, right? So, reject that. Darwinism is a theory at best that cannot be proven. You think Darwin was there when monkey, you know, slowly turned to humans? No, he postulated. So, so my point here is, I believe at this root, of this movement of LGBTQ pink dot is a challenge to God's sovereignty. That out of humans' own intelligence, we can figure out that what is our way forward. We know better. We can decide and interpret what against what God's original design is about. Brothers and sisters, true freedom has boundaries. And within that boundary, there is freedom. Outside of that is anarchism. So do not confuse between the two. God wants us to be free, right? But it has to abide by a certain set of principle and by the original design that He created us to be. Know that also, today, we are not fighting against other people. We are up against a very sinister plot that is fought in the spiritual realm. Know that within, in Ephesians 6, 12, it says very clearly that we are fighting against rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Right? So the warfare is fought in the spirit realm. So again, spirit principles is something that we need to engage and not back down. For the price of losing this battle is family and life that we know it. And the best way to engage the fight head on is through prayers. Right? So I'm going to do my plug-in today to then say, come and attend regular prayer meetings. And we must pray in our own quiet times. We must pray within our LG and we must pray together as a corporate body. So I urge everyone to come and pray whether it's online or physical. Right? Now, if you face resistance to come to prayer group, that's the right kind of feeling that you should get because that's what the enemy is up to. Right? If there's a resistance, then all the more we should actually go against that and come and pray together. Download from God and declare His will on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? Now, so far we have established that family is God's plan modality for us to thrive and to dominate this world. Now, despite many setbacks, God's blessings for us to be fruitful and multiply continues. And because He's sovereign, His words will stand. Now, we are currently in a state of warfare and the enemy is very real and active in defining the concept of family. So therefore, we need to push back. Right? So what is then a strong family should be like? Okay. So this is where I have to show my photo, not because my family is perfect, but I guess at some point in time, they have to come to light. Now, this is the point where my son will start to shrink into his seat and peer, then say, oh, Sabo, ask me to come here and show my photo. So that's me on the, on the right top, top left-hand corner. My son, Luke, is beside, he's here today, and his wife, my, my wife, Jen, beside him. Why, uh, Jen is at home recovering from COVID, so uh, hopefully she's online. Uh, seated down are my parents, my mom and my dad. She's 73, my dad is 75. They are in relatively good health, praise the Lord. And the one standing in front is the prankster called Ezra. So, so a family is a place where 
one established identity. I think a few weeks back, Pastor Colin also preached about this, that the roles in a family is basically bestowed. It is predefined and it's not given or taken away by meritocracy, like how some of us in the workplace is facing, right? If you're good, you get promoted and you take on larger roles as a responsibility. It cannot be that one day Luke is good at it and then we promote him to be the father. Cannot be. <laughs> huh? So in a very rude way, Lim Pei is the father because I'm his father. Ma. Cannot, cannot just say you suck at it, then uh, tomorrow I take over. Don't have such stuff. Huh? If you're father, you're a father. So you cannot basically abdicate this away or you cannot wheel it away and pass it to somebody else. Likewise, the roles and responsibility for ma wife, mother, grandparents and children all predefined. Now parents are to be respected, children are to be loved, and protected, grandparents are to be honoured. This is the order that we have to establish at home. Now, I've seen instances where children will just kind of interrupt, you know, when adults are talking and all that. Now, I'm not an advocate that children should be seen and not heard, but there is a time and place for everything. And parents, we need to basically establish that in the, in the, wife, uh, in, in the household. And wives, you are to be uh, counsels to the husbands, but do give the men uh, some face la, sometimes because we do act stupid. So, you know, in the public, yeah, just give us some face. At home, then, chill ho suan zhang. Then we will say sorry as what Kenneth has said. <laughs> All right? Now, in a family, one is love for who we are, not how well we perform. This basically, God said this in Matthew 3.17 when he was baptized. God says, This is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. God announced this twice, one on the mountaintop when, when Jesus went up and he spoke that to Peter, but the first time was when he was baptised by John. Now, God was pleased with Jesus because of who Jesus is. God didn't say this when Jesus was hung on the cross or when Jesus ascended. So this declaration was made prior to, to Jesus' achievement on earth. So how many of us today as parents pack our rewards and affirmation to our children based on their, the results of their exams, how they do in their things here, or the schools they got themselves into. If we do that, please repent. Right? I understand that we are anxious, Singapore is a very competitive place, and we want our children to do well. But do not make our love conditional. Right? Recently, I saw this article uh, interviewing this football star called Son Hyun Min. Right? He is a, he's a striker for Tottenham Hotspur. And this season, he got the best striker, because he scored the most goal, uh, tie with uh, Mohamed Salah of Liverpool, right? Now, it's not very easy for an Asian to be the top scorer in English Premier League, because you see the English Premier League, all the Amos very big size, especially the defenders, right? And for Asian, which is smaller build, it's very, very difficult to do that, right? Now, they got interview Son's father. Guess what the father said? The father said, my son is still not a world-class player. Can you imagine? It's not a private conversation between a father and son. This father was interviewed and he said publicly, my son is still not world class. I think he can be 10% better than what he is today. Cry out loud, maybe he should go and play and see whether he can. <laughs> right? So, so the Asians, sometimes we, we tend to, you know, you know, want to be too humble, but not, not like that. You know, when you need to celebrate, you celebrate. Right? But the other extreme is also wrong. Right? Some, some of the instances I've seen in the West, they celebrate mediocrity to the extreme. If you, if you hold a competition for a children and there are 10 children taking part, you must have 10 prizes, you know. Everybody goes back with a prize. Nobody will lose one right? because they fear that the children will feel rejected at a young age if they, if they don't win anything. Now, I think that is also too extreme, right? But I think a middle path approach is more realistic. Don't sugarcoat or bubble wrap your children. Make them ready for competition because it is real. Out there, the competition is real. They need to be good but affirm their identity. Because of who they are, your love to them is unconditional. And because they, they know that their identity and they know that they are well-loved, they will do well. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, his first two tests was all about identity because the enemy will always ask him, if you are the son of God, turn this rock into bread. If you are a son of God, throw yourself off the, off the uh, castle wall. Right? So this was all about his identity. The third test was whether would Jesus compromise and worship him so that he can go for a shortcut. Now Jesus passed all three tests, right? Because he functioned from a place of security. Now he knew that the, play, the path that was laid before him by God was necessary. And the only way 
to do it was God's way. Now, Adam sinned through disbelief, but Jesus won it back through belief. And that was actually from a place of security and identity. Now, a strong family is a place where one gets disciplined and also receives grace. Right? Now, whoever spares their rod hates their children. This is, this is from the Bible. Hates their children. So don't do them a favour. Right? Discipline them if they step out of line. But as parents, we need to define where the line is. Don't make the line blur. Then the poor guy, Mutintin, cannot hunt them by you when he crosses the line. He must know where the line is so he doesn't cross it. But when children's KPI is to cross the line and to test whether you respond or not. <laughs> if you don't, they will continuously jump out and see. So you need to draw the line very clear. But when they cross it, you enforce. But however, once you finish enforcing it, that's it. Done already. You cannot go back and keep reminding him, hey, the other day you crossed the line. Huh? So don't, don't do that. Don't be so lost. Off. Right? Children must know that the home is a safe place. It's a place of unlimited love and a wide birth for them. Now, recently I've seen on TikTok, yeah, I know, uh, this old man shouldn't be watching TikTok. But yes, I've been watching TikTok just to keep up with times. I see this TikTok video of this Italian girl that always go and catch out her mother. Because why? The mother cooks. You know, Italian women likes to cook. And they are very proud of their cooking at home. So this girl will always go and catch out the mom. Hey, your cooking sucks. You know, I'll go outside and eat or whatever. And the mom's response, sometimes the language is a bit colourful, but it's actually quite funny to actually see an Italian woman, an old woman, and just like, scold the daughter back. I know it's a little bit perverted. But the reason why the girl does this, when I thought about it, is because she knows that no matter what she do, the mom will continue to love her and continue to cook for her the next day. Right? Of course, the whole point is to test her mom's response and, and, and make a laugh out of it. But essentially, I think this girl is very, very secure in who she is. Right? And reflecting that, Ezra is like that too. You know, he knows his love at home. He knows he can get away with some stuff. And he continues doing it because he knows that, you know, we will just laugh over it and, and, and all that. But in school, he behaves very differently. Because all the reports that we receive from school teachers, oh, he's a very quiet boy, he's very obedient. And then we're like, yeah, oh, you know, this teacher or something, you know, you, you sure you're talking about the right kid. Or not? But the teacher shared with us that kids are like that. Because if they know that they can, they can do it at home, they won't do it outside. Because they know outside, you know, it's a straight and narrow. If they're straight out of line, the teacher will, will score, right? But there are kids who act out in school. Why? Because the home is the reverse. Because the home is not tolerant of them. The home is a place that they do not receive grace. The home is where they get disciplined much worse than what they, are, that what they will get in school. And therefore, they act out in school. So it shudders me to think what kind of environment these kids are facing at home. Recently, we have a case in River Valley High School where a boy, a secondary one boy went to school and never came home because he was hacked to death by, by someone older in school. So again, brothers and sisters, the fight is real. We need to do our work as a family and we need to make sure that our family is strong so that our kids will grow up well. Amen? Alright, so, so again, you know, parents, don't, don't howl and ah. After that, I say, oh, I'll go home. I must discipline my children. Restore them gently. All right? Now, um, learn from God. He is pleased with Jesus because of who Jesus is, not what he achieves. And for that place of security, as I've said, our children can and will fly further than any, was, any one of us can achieve if they know who they are, if they know that they come from a strong place of identity. Amen? Now, family is one place where one acquires inheritance and where history and heritage get passed on. Um, just in case you didn't know, we are facing a stagflation now. This term was introduced here on the pulpit by, by Brother Richard not too long ago. In essence, it is a situation where the economy is not growing, but yet inflation is on the way up. So your, in this perfect storm, your liquidity that you hold on hand is losing its value very, very quickly. Now, inheritance is one way that our children get a head start in life. Right? With the escalating cost of home. Nowadays, uh, one flat is how much? A million? In one point something, huh? I was saying. Right? Your cars is a tenth. Right? The COE alone is 100,000. Right? It can get quite challenging for the next generation if they wish to have the same kind of achievement in life because things are just so expensive. At least materially, with inheritance, they get a head start and, and, and potentially start at a different starting line. Now, 
in Bible it said very clearly by Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 14 that children shouldn't save up for their parents, but parents for their children. And, and of course somebody will say, hey, you know what, Bill Gates, huh, they don't save, huh, they all donate away, Warren Buffett also like that. But please, uh, are we in that same league you know, where we have billions and billions of dollars? We're not there. So for the time being, please, uh, if you're not there yet, save for your kids. Don't go and buy the next expensive watch or, or buy a very expensive car. If, even though you can afford, save for your children. right? Or, of late, I realize that many of us may not be well acquainted with issues pertaining to financial management. So here's another plug-in. Uh, we are organizing Compass course. Now this is a training that shares with you the biblical principles of how to handle wealth. In Bible alone, there are 2,000 over verses containing financial and, and how to handle money. Right? So this is definitely one topic that God wants us to pay attention to. So please sign up if you haven't. Right? I, I'm sure, and the teacher is uh, Brother Ken here, so I'm sure he has a lot of good things to share with us. Oh, and one of the topics that's covered in Compass is actually about inheritance. Now inheritance is not just about money. Now King Solomon himself in Ecclesiastes did say that wisdom, light and inheritance is a good thing. Right? Now, Chinese have a saying, Fu Bu Guo San, that means the wealth cannot pass to three generations. I guess if you're just looking at wealth alone, I think that, that could possibly be it. But when wealth is coupled together with wisdom, I think there's a good chance for it too. Right? Now, pass down also your life experience. This will be also a very good help for future generations. So that they do not need to reinvent the wheel and make the same painful mistakes that we have learned through our lives. Now, family history is also a very rich form of inheritance. Don't neglect to pass on stories of your forebears to your children. I remember when I was young, my grandma would make it a point, or maybe because last time TV not so exciting and there's no YouTube. So he would tell me about his, my granddad and her, how they, you know, my granddad came to Singapore like, oh, so na young. Like, oh, oh, oh. Then the hatch opened and he's down there, you know. Yes, he came from China to escape poverty, right? And, and of course, he met my grandma. Right? My, my granddad was a carpenter, right? Like, a bit like Jesus, huh? he was a carpenter. But during, after the war, he became a chef. Hainan, ma, so people kind of stereotype. But maybe he also liked to cook. La. So he was the chef for GM of uh, ABM Embro, the Dutch bank. And, and my, my grandma came to Singapore. He, her story is a little bit more sad because she doesn't know who her parents are. She was just thrown to her auntie and, and they took a boat to Singapore. Also another Uso Nanyang case, right? But when, they came to, when she came to Singapore, all her relatives became ma jie, so they saw her, yeah? so they, 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 they declared celibacy. Thank goodness my grandma didn't follow that, that career path, because otherwise they would not, I would not be here anymore. <laughs> so my granddad go and counsel her. La, oh. Now the interesting part was my granddad is a pure Hainanese. He don't speak a word of anything else. He just spoke Hainanese. My grandma was a Cantonese. How my granddad go and uh, counsel her, I don't know. <laughs> but they got married. And my grandma went in and knowing that this household only speaks Hainanese, Jialat. She told me that she picked up Hainanese in a month. Now, if you guys know Hainanese, right? Hainanese is not an easy dialect to pick up. So my grandma is a little bit, got a little bit of linguistic flair. La. Now, why is this important? Because when things are tough, when I look back, I recognize that I came from a generation where they had resilience. My granddad and grandma went through a lot of suffering during the war. Right? They were very creative, how they created food to, to keep their children alive during the war. My granddad's skills with hands is something that I can recognize with. I like to make stuff. Right? He likes to cook. I like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandma is really good at linguistically. Eh? I mean, linguistically, she's good. I, I'm not saying I'm linguistic, linguistically good, but I think I think can, uh, huh? can pinch a bit. So these are things that remind her of who I am. And these are the stories that you can also define for your children, who they came from. So they know that they came from a life, they came from a line of people who have these skills and advantages that is actually in their DNA. So when things that get tough, they, when they are in, things are in doubt, this is what they are constituted. Right? There's, there's a family heritage that you can pass on to your kids as well. Now family is where positive attitudes and, and values are cultivated. Earlier we mentioned that the enemy is very, very active, in case you didn't know. Actually, they are working very, very hard to, to, to throw in all this perversion to our children nowadays, right? Recently, you have heard this Buzz Lightyear, right? You watch Toy Story, this guy from Infinity and Beyond, this, this guy with the wing. Right? They are creating a story by Disney right now. 
and they refuse to edit out one scene where they show a same-sex couple kissing, and they refuse to edit it out, even at the cost of not showing that show in China and, 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 and Saudi Arabia markets. Why? There is a, a very insidious kind of a, a plot to, to push those values through mainstream media. Right? Now, children are great listeners, but they are very poor interpreters, especially during their formative years. So the principle of first mention, as I mentioned here, is important. As parents, it is our responsibility to inculcate and sow the first seeds into our children's mind, right? Especially for very difficult topics like how do you handle money, right? How do you respect gender? What is gender boundaries? Sexuality. Don't shy away from these tough topics. Find a nice way, a simple way, birds and the bees kind of conversation and, and teach them to your children because this are their first encounter to these lessons and these are the values that they put in. Because later on in life, when somebody else tries to introduce something else, they will use this as a benchmark to compare. Because my dad says, this is the right. The family is a mum. Mum is a woman, guy is a man. You know, husband is a man. And, and anything else is different from that. Right? So, I remember this story from Jackie Chan when he was the ambassador for our Central Narcotics Bureau. He said that when he was young, the father told him two things. Don't gamble, don't take drugs. Because these two things will cause a man to fall. Now, you, if you know Jackie Chan's story, at a very young age, the, the father and mother sent him to an opera school to learn Kung Fu with Hong Jing Pao, you know, all that. And, and, and they become, you know, now the, the, the 12 of them become really good, you know, martial art um, artists in, in the Hong Kong film history, right? So he actually stayed away from his father for the longest time when he was young. But he remembered these two things that the father told him. And even though he's rich, and of course he has fallen, he has also done other things that... Uh, that we shouldn't do. He has many wives and many, many children. But these two things he never touched. He never touched money, uh, never touched drugs, and he never do gambling. Um, so this is law of first mention, right? Because the father inculcated to him at a very young age, and he remembered them. And he took them as his values. But clearly he didn't tell this to his son, because a few years later his son was caught taking drugs in China. So again, another example, right? You need to pass it on when you know something and you have done something good, pass it on to your children as well, so that they will stick to the straight and narrow. Now this verse is basically taken from Proverbs, right? Now I know when, when children see this, they will sigh. This is the one that all the parents will, will use this against their children. You must listen to your laupe and you must listen to your laupu, right? But in the Passion Translation, it is actually put very beautifully. The version that I've articulated here is the one in NIV, but I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. Pay close attention, my children, to your father's words and never forget your mother's instructions, for their insights will bring you success, adorning you with grace-filled thoughts and giving you reins to guide your decisions. Now, many children here, including myself, sometimes will ask, how much can my parents teach us of the world right now? The world is changing so fast. It's what they know, still even valid in my case. Now, I think after thinking through my responses, yes, technology changed very fast. In fact, it's changing so fast and it's accelerating even faster. But one thing don't change. The fallen human nature is still the same. We still screw up at the same, th you know, at the same temptations. People are still greedy, right? There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Be like Elisha. He yearns for the mantle of Elijah, his sifu, right? And with that kind of mindset, Actually, he received double the anointing when he received his mental. So with the right kind of mindset, intergenerational transfer of anointing can be doubled and multiplied. But we need to approach it with the right mindset. So parents, as I've said, you know, don't howlian too much. Huh? Because we are the pride of our children. We need to do well in the day-to-day -day because our children will look up to us. This is what Basically, Apostle Paul also reminded parents as well, do not exasperate your children. In fact, as parents, we also have to recognize that we need to basically keep up to times. And the world is changing very, very fast. We can learn a lot from our younger generation of what is going on and make ourselves relevant. So start this intergenerational conversation. Let it be built on honor, trust, and humility. Amen? Okay. The roles of a wife and husband, I'm running out of time, 
So this one, um, now if the husband is the head of the household, then the wife is the neck. Uh, right? The Chinese have a saying, uh, ta se, ta chi chun. You know what does that mean? When you hit the snake, uh, don't hit on the head, no, because you'll make the snake angry and bite you, because the head, head got skull and <laughs> very hard to kill the snake when you hit the head. You hit seven inches down from the head, that's where the organs are. So essentially, that is what the devil did. La. Instead of targeting Adam, we target Eve. La. Huh? So, again, I said, you know, if the, if the enemy you can't ask me to eat from the fruit, I say you're going to ask Jen first. <laughs> then, end of story already. Because <laughs> my wife is definitely more clever than me. Alright? Now, a lot of people, based on the verse earlier, plus Genesis 2nd 18, eh, to say, you know what? God create a helper for Adam. And then they say, see, woman is subservient to men. Okay? I think, let me suggest that this, let me debunk this once and for all. Alright? Now, this helper word that is found in Genesis 2.18, right, when you translate to Hebrew, right, it's called Isa Kenegdo. So I, I don't know, it's a pastor giver here. I may have mispronounced it completely and ruined it. But this is basically what I found online. All right, it means an ally or rescuer, someone who comes running when people cry out for help. Now this word Isa was used 17 times in the Old Testament to describe how God is a source of help for Israel. So is God subservient to Israel? No. So don't use helper and thinking that helper is your domestic helper, that kind of helper. No, it's not. It is basically equal, if not greater. So, um, yeah, so Kenneth was right. Just say sorry. <laughs> yeah, things will be simpler, much simpler. Huh? That is life lesson, okay? In fact, if there's any takeaway from that, that one was, that, that was the sermon in off by itself. Okay? Now, husbands, love your wife, right? Now, this is Apostle Paul, a single man. He can tell you this. Right? And in fact, it says, husbands ought to love your wife as your own body. Alright? Now, frankly, I do love my body very much. I feed it constantly. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell, right? So I feed my wife well too, lah. I don't believe you ask her. Right? Now, jokes aside, but a strong family needs to be built on a strong marriage because children will see and feel how the parents love each other, how parents resolve conflict. It is important because they will emulate, emulate that later in their lives. And there will be less confusion, really. The onslaught that our children face on the media right, these days are, are really something that we have never seen before. So we have to set our example properly, right? So the role of a father in the family, as I wrap up today, now a father bestows identity to our children. When I was doing the research for this sermon, this verse came repeatedly. How God affirmed Jesus as his son. Of course, God will do the same if you are a daughter. Right? But the context is, he said this to Jesus even before Jesus finished his mission and his ministry on earth. Now, fathers play a key role in a family. I'm not saying this because mothers are not important. Mothers and fathers both are important, but because today is, is Father's Day, so we, we, we talk about father. Lah, huh? Now, fathers identify the, the children's strengths and help them develop, sharpen it, and achieve their dreams. Now, boys need to be affirmed. Essentially, the dad has a very specific role to raise up boys, to let them know that they have what it takes to do what is needed to be done. Right? Girls need to know that they are worth it. They are, they are pretty, and they are made whole as it is. Right? The father needs to affirm that. Because if you don't, all the female magazines and the beauty magazines will do it for you. And frankly, it's very, very cheap at one. Trust me, I know. Every time I see an ad on Facebook, tell me to go intermittent fasting. Right? Because the world will define things that are not achievable and it will make you feel very exasperated. Right? Now, mothers play a very key role as well. Right? Whether when you're in pain, the mother is a comforter and the mother is also a source of mercy. But fathers and mothers are both indispensable in the family's context. Now, as I wrap up, in John 14.31, Apostle John said that Jesus' role is to showcase to the world right, that he can do exactly what the Father has sent him to do. To me, this is the greatest reward any child can give to his father. Now, I glow with pride when I see my boys emulate me. Right? Uh, not in a very contrived way because I'm watching but in almost like a second nature. Because the greatest gift that a father can receive is to know that 
what we do, right? When we provide for our children, the sacrifices that we have done is worth it because that DNA that we want to inculcate, whether it's physically or, or, or spiritually, will continue to perpetuate on through their lives long after we have passed. So when I was tasked to speak at this pulpit as early as February, so yes, Pastor Colin arrows you very early, um, I didn't know that this would be actually done before Father's Day, right? So only later, sometime in April, when I was preparing this, uh, I tried to find time on Saturday and Sunday nights to do this. Then the Holy Spirit prompted me, go, go and ask when is Father's Day. And when I found out, then more pressure, lah, because this kind of topic, say before Father's Day, or and somewhere online, right? So overall, this message has been very useful when I was in, in my in my research for me personally, and I hope that it will be useful for you, right? Um, I end today's sermon by really wishing all the fathers in Petra a happy Father's Day. You have a mission, and you are not alone, right? Because as I close, I would like to close with Malachi 4, 6. That before the world comes to judgment, God will send the Spirit of Elijah. And to do what? To basically turn the father's hearts to the children and turn the hearts of the children to the father. We're not doing this alone. Yes, the enemy is stepping up his activities, but let's not put our focus on the enemy. Let's put our focus on God. Because we are not going to do this alone. God will send help. Right? But we need to reclaim that position in our household as fathers and mothers, right? So that we will create a strong family and through that, our children will carry that DNA and take over this world because we have done our job well, right? So with this, I thank you and I wish all the fathers in, in Petra a happy Father's Day. Thank you very much.